anyway, thank you so much, Nancy Joe, for letting me hang out with everybody. Let's give it up for Nancy Joe. <laughs> so Nancy asked me to chat about some things that have changed in my business a little bit in the last couple months. You know, I've done this for 19 years. How many of you have been in the business about as long as me? And, you know, I've been doing this, the same type of business for many, many years, same as you have been, I bet. And um, I want to talk to you about what I've been doing lately to change what I do to take care of my customers. And I want to give you a little bit of background. So, first of all, um, I worked at Consumers Energy for many years, for 28 years. And one of my last jobs there was to investigate complaints. If somebody called the company and they complained not just to a customer service rep, if they complained to the governor or a legislator or the president of the company, if they sent a letter to those people, they didn't solve the problem. I was the one who had to solve those problems. And after I finally got to the bottom of the complaint and figured out who, you know, what happened and figured out blame, then the investigation finished with me assessing the department that caused the problem with the blame. So I was very used to digging down, not just seeing a problem just on its surface or a thought on its surface, but my background was really to go back in time and figure out what happened to get us to where we are today. Because I always have been like this. I mean, for many, many years, I, I like to find out what's going on. My husband, if I have a conversation with him many times, I'll ask so many questions to say, what is this, the Spanish Inquisition? What is it with you? Because I just never take anything at face value for what he says. I mean, I never believe what he says for the most part. I never really trust what he says. I gotta like investigate everything. So um, I've been thinking about the changes in our industry as a whole, and especially listening to what Tracy's been chatting about. So I wanna talk to you about the model that was very common for most years for marketing, and it was a marketing funnel. You're familiar with this at all? The marketing funnel started up here where you make people aware of your business or your what you have then you create interest and i'll explain how this goes then you've got to create desire and then they make a purchase all right so in 1980 when the company was formed the company did a really great job of quickly getting out there and it took some years but we got people aware of the company we got them to be interested in it so people would be pushed down in this funnel you can imagine people come in they're aware of pampered chef they like it we do our job and we build desire for the product and at the bottom here they make a purchase but if you can see what the bottom of the funnel is like what happens to them after they make the purchase they just fall out because in the early days, there were tons of people to keep pushing into this funnel. And we didn't really have to worry about the people falling out because there were so many fish to get, right? Yeah. So what's changed in the business? Well, when I had a, we had a call with Tracy. First of all, she explained in 1980 when the company was started, there were seven Bed Bath & Beyond <coughs> stores, seven. Yeah. Today there's 1,500, right? Yeah. So can people find some really great products in other places today than before? Certainly, right? right? In 1980, who was the name of the game for showing them really cool recipes like rings and braids and stuff? Pampered yeah. Chef. Yeah. Who's the big game now? Where do they go? Yeah. 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 To the internet. Yeah. internet. To the internet. They can learn anything, right? So we have to change along with the way our customers are changing. Um, so this model worked for many, many years. But today, there are how many direct selling companies are there? We're not really competing with another marketer of kitchen tools, right? There really is no other game in town. But we're competing for people's time and interest and awareness and interest and desire because they can buy a plethora of things online and through direct sales, right? All right, so that's how, that's how it was. So thinking about our business, we would go out to parties and we were meeting people all the time, right? People were coming to our parties, we were booking parties, they were interested in us. We didn't really have to think too much beyond that night because we got our bookings and we kept our business going. Today there's a completely different marketing model that people use and I'm gonna explain it to you and we'll, we'll, I'm gonna talk to you then about how this all figures in to what I'm gonna chat with you about. So it's called the loyalty loop. And this is how it works. You start over here, and the, uh, the uh, first piece is the consideration, same as it was before. So in our business, the consideration for, when I think about our parties, would be things like 
we send out an invitation to our guests. We get our host on board with putting us out on Facebook. We get awareness of the party that's coming up. We get awareness of our, our business. And it's a lot different than it was in 1980, right? I mean, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have any of the tools we have today. So there's lots of ways to build interest. I, um, one of the things that I will tell you is that on my invitations, I used to put on there, if you can't come to the party, you can shop online at blank. And instead of that, my daughter, who's the marketing guru, says what you need to put on there is um, check out our products at my website before the party. This is why people don't shop the way they used to do. How many of you investigate things online? If you want to buy something, you don't just go willy-nilly out to the store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody searches and compares and looks online. So I want to encourage these people to look at my website, look at the products before they come. This is how young people buy. They look first, so encourage these people. We want to get some consideration. We want them to be looking there. That's good. I like to use a mini catalog because it builds interest. They might have not be familiar with our products, so now they're going to see things. They're going to be interested in it. It might encourage them to come, and if nothing else, it might encourage them to purchase even more. We have our websites where we can build. You know, uh, maybe got Facebook. So. This is the original, this is the first uh, part of the loyalty loop. Then you go up here and they go from that to active consideration. And active consideration, in, at, for the most part, is our party. That's where we get them now to consider us. Now we get to show them what we've got. Now we get to really put on a, a great presentation to get them to think about purchasing something. And nine times out of 10 at a party, they are gonna purchase something. So we've gotta get them from here up to here. We've got them to be actively looking um, at us. And then it goes to closure, which is the purchase. Or the booking or whatever your, you know, purchase or booking or becoming a consultant. Um, so this used to be the end of the whole thing. We got them here and we were happy and we went on our way. What we want to do now is we want to find a way to get them from here back to here and then from here right back to purchase without even having to go up here. And the way we do that is we give them triggers along the way to get them back to considering us. Okay, so let me explain what I mean. So you, you had a customer at a party. There are all kinds of things that we can do now to get that customer to think about us again, to get us to go back to that consideration. Oh, Pampered Chef, maybe I better check out our website. And now that they're a loyal customer, they zoom right over here and purchase again from us. Mm -hmm. And this is what companies <coughs> strive for. This is what they want. And there are, we're gonna talk about a ton of ways to trigger that consideration and that purchase again. Mm -hmm. So the biggest one that's changed for our company in recent months is the outlet. Why do you think the company provided us with that fabulous outlet? What do you do when something's really great at the outlet? What's the first thing you're doing? Yeah. You're sharing, you're t screaming it from the rooftops. Oh my gosh, we have got great sales. The company is changing it and there's a strategy for when they change it too because it's gonna be at times when they want you to be in touch with your customers. And what they're doing is training our customers to go to our websites. They're training them that there will be new surprises there and that's perfect for our business, right? How many of you got some great online orders in the last six months? Did it, did it affect your bottom line? Yes. It did. So there's lots of things that you can do to help those triggers. So we're gonna talk about some other things. But it is so important today to improve what we call the post-purchase experience. And we want to talk about the post-purchase experience. Once somebody's bought from you, you cannot afford to let them just go away like we used to be able to. Because quite honestly, if you don't build a loyal following of your customers, if you aren't the one, somebody else is going to. And I know I've had my feelings hurt when I see customers buying, like I see it on Facebook, they're buying from somebody else's Pamper Chef business, but you know what? That's the name of the game. I gotta work to get them in mind. So, um, thinking about this, the closure, the party, 
at your party, let's say you've got 10 to 15 people there, right? You have a, a good crowd. How many of them might book a party on average? What would you say? If it were a good night, what would you get? Two, two or three, three maybe, right? And then maybe you might get a consultant or two. But out of those 10 or 15, how many does that leave that didn't connect with you enough to stay and get back on your calendar? So if there's a whole bunch of people that either did want to book a party or didn't want to become a consultant, but that doesn't mean they don't want more from you, right? Right. We want to find out what else we can do from them because there's a lot of people that will never have a party. Just let's be honest. There are people that are too busy, their house is too small, they got too many animals, Chris Madden knows. Um, <laughs> they, um, they made a pact with their husband, they'll never have parties, etc., etc. So I can't change that, but I can keep them as a customer. All right, so um, we're going to talk about touch points. Ways to touch the customer in ways that will get them back into our loyalty loop. Okay? All right. So we'll leave that up there. So let's talk about <laughs> some of the things. So one of the things that I changed is when I get home from a party, well, let me go back. At the party, um, I have been really trying to work Facebook. I'm not the greatest at it. I'm not the, in the really the age group that loves and, and understands Facebook, but I have done a ton of research on Facebook, <laughs> trying to figure out what is successful and what is not successful. And I've learned a whole bunch of things that aren't successful. But the first thing I want to do at a party is instead of telling people, hey, find me on Facebook, friend request me on Facebook, which a lot of consultants do, I tell them, hey, when I get home, I'm gonna friend request you all on Facebook. So when you see my friend request, don't dog me. Accept my friend request so that I can keep in touch with you. And I can put you in my group and I can provide specials and I can do recipes. So I give them enough reasons why I want them to accept my friend request. And then, and I said, you know, you can find me too. And then the, the next thing that I do is I send them an email that night thanking them for coming to Nancy's party, telling them that if they've decided <coughs> now to still host a party, I have a special gift for them. Here's the recipe that we made that night. And I sent you a friend request on friend Facebook if you're on Facebook, and don't forget to like me. The easiest way to find friends is usually to go to the host, hopefully you've made friends with the host, go to the host page, of course, and then search for friends and then you'll be able to find the guests. That's, that's the easiest way. So an email right after the party is gonna cement the relationship. It's a really fun email and I think I brought a copy of it and I think I'm gonna give it to Nancy Jo what I send out, okay? So make sure you do that. All right, the, um, the next thing that you could do would be to send an email about a month after the party, and it would be personalized to the guests. Now, if you're running a business with 15 or 20 parties a month, then this may not all be possible. But I'm guessing that most of us run a business with maybe six parties, eight parties a month, and if you really want to try to do some of this, you probably can find the time. This doesn't take all that much time. But you would send an email. How many of you have ever gotten an email? You've made a purchase from Pottery Barn or something, and they will send you an email with a coupon that says, hey, shop now, we'd love to have you, you know, check this out. So what you could do is send an email and saying, hey, Ashley, thanks for your purchase of your brownie pan. I hope you're having, you know, I hope you're loving it. You know, since you love the brownie pan, maybe you would like the blank and you make a suggestion for a product and then you offer her 10% discount maybe on her next purchase if she calls you or emails you. This is what my daughter at Whirlpool does. This is how they try to get a customer to come back and purchase again. They give them a discount. So you could maybe offer a little bit of a discount. Um, I read a, a story about Nordstrom's. Have you, how many of you heard about Nordstrom's fabulous customer service? What was interesting about Nordstrom's is they collect stories about great customer service. They're really famous for providing great customer service. And one of the stories was that a customer came in to return a product to Nordstrom. It was a $17 product. It was not from Nordstrom's because they don't sell that product, they said. They didn't even sell it but they promptly refunded the customer for $17. And this is why. Nordstrom has studied their average customer who comes in and spends one time, during their lifetime, that customer will spend $8,000. So what's a $17 refund in the big scheme of things? So you have to think about that for your business. If something does come up, and you know you're right and the customer is probably wrong, but is there a way to keep her happy so that if she were a typical customer like Nordstrom's and she had the potential to spend $8,000 from you in her lifetime, 
what would you do differently to keep her in your loop of loyal customers? Because you know the drill. If someone loves you, they'll tell 10 people, but if they don't love you, they'll tell 100 people or something like that. All right, so another thing that you can do, of course, is send out the customer's uh, connection email. The company has one of those, but maybe personalize it. Rather than, because uh, quite honestly, I get a lot of your emails, your, your uh, excuse me, newsletters, newsletters, and nobody personalizes them. You know, you can put a personal message in there, um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute what message that you might want to put in there. All right, so the thing with these loyal customers that have started already purchasing from you is that per people who have already purchased from you are far more likely to spend again when you contact them again. As a matter of fact, um, they did a study on customers that are first exposed to a product, they might have a chance of like 8 to 12% chance of purchasing, but once they bought from you, 60% chance of them repurchasing from you. So we want to get them, you know, repurchasing. How many of you do have customers that are purchasing on your outlet, you see the All same the names coming yeah. through? Yeah, so one thing that I've started doing with those people is reaching out to them and saying, oh my gosh, you are crazy girl, you're always buying at my outlet. Would you consider just being a Facebook catalog online consultant from me? You can get your stuff at discount and you can do the same thing, get your friends to buy at your outlet and I got one recruit that way. Just because she was always ordering on my outlet, right? Just being aware of what's going on with your customers. Um, okay, so let's talk about other things that you can do. We talked a little bit about emails. Another suggestion would be to ask your host, you could do all your customers if you don't have a huge business, ask your host when's their birthday and have a birthday email or a birthday card that goes out offering her a discount her birthday month. One girl actually offers a free party, a repeat party if they do a party in their birthday month and she'll bring the wine and the cake. I mean, because some people, quite honestly, I don't get a birthday party. Who's going to give me a birthday party? The man that I don't even believe anything he says, he's not giving me a birthday party. <laughs> Nobody's giving me a birthday Who's party. Who's got my shoes? <laughs> my shoes are gone. Okay. Everybody loves to see their feet. I'm like, what Judy, kind of shoes I can't find your shoes. What oh, kind of I'm shoes not are worry about it. <laughs> okay. I can't I Another time to get a hold of your customers so we can do the birthday thing. Um, every time there's a new season launch, this is just a cyclical thing. Anytime there's a new you know, season, we need to get in touch with our loyal customers, right? Maybe on the one year anniversary of their party, the company sends out an email, but it's probably not the most inviting one. Maybe you could do your own, right? All right, so another thing that you could do would be to have you know, a holiday party for your past hosts. Um, encourage them to come. They, can, they love to come to your house. So one of the things that I um, researched, um, I love to stalk other direct sales companies. I don't know if you, any of you guys do this. Do any of you do this? I go out on Pinterest and I put in, I find other people who are successful in direct sales. So there's this girl named Melissa Feetsome and she's really big in 31. So what I found from Melissa was the idea of sending happy mail. Happy mail. Happy mail. Uh, the idea is that whatever you send goes in a clear plastic bag so that everyone who sees it can see what's in there. And I don't know about you, but do you love getting mail? I love getting mail. I like, I run out to the mailbox hoping there's something cool in it. So the idea is you've had a party with a host and we want to keep her loyalty. So one month after her party, you send her some kind of gift for being a host of yours. And this one, was all for my December host. Happy New Year from your Pampered Chef consultant. Thank you for hosting a cooking party with me. As one of my very favorite hosts of 2015, I want to send you my thanks for your business and friendship. I'm wishing you and yours a very happy 2016, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. There's my name. Um, there's her uh, label. And then inside, there'll be, this is why I sent this one at Christmas time, but there'll be a recipe, there'll be a coupon, there'll be the thank you, and then there's some directions on what to do with that three onion rub that I sent her. And I bought the three onion rubs, quite honestly, when they were buy one, get one free, right? It doesn't have to be this expensive. But I have gotten more emails, messages on Facebook, private messages, thanking me for the gift. Oh yeah. Do you think they're gonna call another consultant if they need something? I don't think so. And I'll be honest, when, I, when the company went to emailing receipts automatically, I kind of got out of the habit of sending my normal thank you note with the receipts. How many of you kind of quit doing that? 
So this would kind of replace that. Because think about it, we had to send that big thing of receipts and postage and copying. This kind of replaces that. If you want to try to justify the cost, I'm How not doing that anymore. I'm doing this. How much is it Go ahead. now? How much is the postage? Uh, this th this was two dollars and sixty four cents per. Just like that. Just I said it just like this. Where's the re where's the two the address? Excuse me. It's label. Got it. So I'll pass it around. I'm I'm gonna give you all this stuff. Um, but other ideas. Let's just say you want to go to the dollar store. Grace, what? No, I'm not giving you any spices. You can get your own darn spices. I'm gonna give you the template. Yes. Yes. Um, I give them to, I mean, most of my hosts are pretty darn special. So I give them to almost every one of my hosts. I want her to think she's a special host, but they really do the grace. A catalog host I have not, unless they're over 500. Okay, because, I, I mean, I did 129 parties in 2015. So at Christmas time, because I hadn't started this, I sent out every host one. I sent out 95 of them in December. Um, but you can do it much cheaper. Think about this. They, they <coughs> go to Pinterest and look, put in happy mail or put in Melissa Feetsum, F-E-I-T-S-A-M. F-E-I-T-S-A-M, Melissa Feetsum. She has tons of ideas. She has tons, she does bingo shows. So she explains her bingo show and she does lots of fun stuff. But things like go to the Target or the dollar store and get some Valentine socks in for February. They're gonna send them out in February. You really knocked my socks off, Ashley, with a great party. Um, lipstick, um, uh, uh, no, like lip balm. She said like, um, here's a big uh, moth for you for being a great host. Just fun things. I can see Grace's wheels are turning like this is something she would like to do. This would be up your alley, right? I do love So that. Happy Mail also translates very well to consultants. Yeah. Because consultants need a touch point. We're going to talk about that in a minute. All right. The big thing that changed for me was doing cooking parties at my house. And a lot of you have heard about it. I did a phone call about it. So I'm going to explain it just a little bit. I don't want to belabor it because I figure you probably know what I'm talking about, but this is why I started doing this. Remember we talked about the customers who bought, but they wouldn't book and they wouldn't become a consultant. I wanted to find a way to reach those people to bring them back into my group so that they would consider and purchase again. And trust me, they purchase very well at these parties. Um, a couple of, there's a couple of psychologies behind it. First of all, people want to come, they're nosy. They want to see where you live. They want to see what you got going on. You, they, you, they've invited you into their house. They've been gracious enough to open up their house. Now you open up your house to them. And typically we used to only do kinds of things like host appreciation events or like we wanted to have some kind of sale. These you can really do every single month. And if you could train your consultants to do a cooking class at their house every month, imagine the impact it could have on their business. So let me just tell you, what's the difference between a cooking class and a cooking party or a show? Very little, except in who you invite, how you invite, and it, there's more focus on the food and not so much on the sales. The sales will just come because they have so much darn fun and you're calling it a cooking class. So how many of you have gone and taken a cooking class at Williams and Sonoma or any place? Who's taken a formal cooking class? Patty, how about how much do they charge oh, at Sir Latam? 80 bucks. 80, 80 bucks, 60, 60 bucks, bucks, 70 bucks, right? So this is a free cooking class. And what you do is you pick a theme. That's what gets, that's the marketing of it. That's what gets people excited. So I'll tell you the ones I've done. I did the 10 at a time, which is teaching them how to take prepared meat, cooking it, freezing it, and then making 10 meals, right? I did a, a appetizer. So with the, um, at my uh, meeting in January, we talked about our teams should do a, an appetizer party, like call it a soup, get ready for Super Bowl cooking class. Teach them how to make appetizers. We all know how to do this. I mean, we know the recipes. All you're doing is bundling some recipes together, putting a name on it, finding a few facts on, I, I just Google stuff, and then teaching them a few things and letting them go cook and then doing a drawing and getting some prizes and getting orders. And you finish it up just like a regular old party because they're so excited they're buying stuff like crazy. Um, the next one that I did uh, for January was soups. I have a whole and I have, I brought that one with me. Um, and I'll give it to Nancy Joe to put on, the, or I'll, I can post it up there. But the whole first page is all facts on soup. I just went out and Googled soup. And then I have 
all kinds of recipes that the consultant can, take, can pick from. So what I'm doing is teaching my consultants to do a workshop, cooking class every month, and I hand feed them what to do. I mean, they can't say they don't know what to do. I've got it all done for them. And on the back page, um, I have a list of just some of the products you need to make soup. And then I have things like, you know, manual food processor, stock pot, all-purpose pot. I have all the products that they should get if they want to make soup. Um, the other one that I am almost done with is I am taking um, a cool and serve tray and filling it with fresh veggies, broccoli, carrots, uh, red pepper, etc. Because how many of you go to the grocery store, you buy a bunch of fresh vegetables because you're going to be on a diet. I always tell this at my parties, you know, on Sunday I go to the grocery store, buy a bunch of groceries. I'm, gonna be, I'm really going to be on a diet this week. By Thursday I'm eating ice cream directly out of the damn container. <laughs> I don't even get a bowl out, I'm just eating it. And the vegetables are all rotting in my refrigerator and I go to the store next week and I throw out, what's the first thing you do? You throw out the old vegetables and you put in the new to repeat the process one more week. So this way, you tell them to buy, you tell them exactly what to get, the ingredients, and then you say, and then you can make these, and I've got like eight recipes in mind, but I made up three. Uh, cauliflower fried rice, um, we did chicken alfredo soup with the light alfredo sauce, and we did like the summertime pasta or the springtime pasta. It worked beautifully with that one little cool and serve tray full of veggies. They were delicious, they're healthy, and I think people are really gonna love knowing what to do with vegetables. And if they had a plan, they would do it. So anyway, how are you, I wanna just explain how you invite people to this, because this is critical to teach your team how to do this. All right, so I will tell you the way not to invite people. Guess what I'm gonna tell you? Facebook. Correct. Just these blanket posts out on Facebook, or even a Facebook uh, event, does not work. It, it's a little bit, but it does not work. People are flooded every day with those invitations. I don't know about you, but I am sick of jamberry. You know, I don't want to pick which jamberry I like. I don't like any of them. They're all ugly. I don't want to. I don't want to be part of the game. I don't. I, I mean, I don't want to guess what movie it is. Looking at some nails and some clothes. I got no idea. I don't have a clue. But you know what I mean? They're just crazy. Um, what does work is um, sending uh, an email through your customer con con connection. And I brought the example of my invitation. So you're just gonna cut and paste it into an email. And you're always gonna call it a free cooking class. And you are always gonna limit how many people you can have in the class. Why? Because when something is limited yeah. or exclusive, you're gonna get way better response than saying, hey, I can take any number of people. You can come whenever you want, bring me anybody. You say, I've got room for, you tell them how many you've got room for. I limit mine to 20 people. And I usually will take reservations up to like 23 or 24 because we all know there are going to be some cancellations, right? So you're going to limit your attendance, you're going to send out an email, and you are going to start to get responses. So this leads me to emails. When you have a customer at your party, what's the one thing that the company has set up for us to get very first thing? What is it? Email address. But how many of you teach your consultants and tell them, okay, but if you don't get the email address, well, then you can put in this or you can put in that. They are shooting themselves in their foot doing that. If they don't build up a customer uh, you know, list, they can't do any of this marketing that we're talking about. We need those email addresses. We need to connect with them on Facebook. So what I tell people at my parties is, you know, on the receipt, it's gonna ask you for your email, ladies, and let me just tell you, it's so that we can get your product under warranty and so that we can communicate with you. I'm not gonna, you know, sell your email or anything like that. So please don't be afraid to give me your email. Everybody will give you their email. If you just put it like that, it's just your expectation. How about on outside orders? I used to, when I was taking catalog orders all the time, not even bother to ask, because I was always just setting up the dummy account, no more. I tell all my catalog hosts, please get me email addresses, because I want to get those addresses. So um, I think uh, my daughter said that um, in her business, the only way they get an email is if they can get a customer to fill out a warranty card. That's why you always get those warranty cards um, from appliances and things, because then they get their, your email, because you're kind of an anonymous buyer when you buy a dishwasher, but once you fill out that email card, they've got you, and now they can market to you. Uh, uh, I cannot remember the price, but it was more than $100 that an email address is worth in the, in the business world. Email addresses are very, very valuable, so make sure you train your customers. Train your consultants, because they don't understand the why. Do you know what I mean? They don't know why. They just want to do it the easy way. Now you're teaching them why 
to do it. So anyway, you're going to work on some come cook with me classes. Your customers will start to become so attached to you because they're going to get to come to your house and see some fun things and do some fun things. Um, I'll pass out the, the flyer and I'll, I'll put it on the Facebook page. So anyway, just so you know, from the come cook with me classes that I did, I only did four of them this fall. Um, I think I tracked my sales from those events plus the bookings that I got was well over $12,000 in just a couple of months, just from those classes. Um, tons and tons of future bookings and three recruits coming off of those, not just the parties that I did, but the bookings that resulted from it. Um, all right, so let me wrap this up because my time is probably uh, about done. I'm sorry? Yes, Brian? The cooking class? Um, some months. How often do you do them for yourself and how often do you teach your team to do them? All right, I teach my team every month to do one of these at our team meeting. So if you want to get your team to the meeting, tell them that you're going to teach them a new cooking class style. So now the pe my people are coming back to learn a different one every month because they know they're going to get the pass out. They're going to get, we actually do them right at the meeting. It is just a station style show once you do the cooking class. There's really no different. But what you do is you're going to provide them with like um, a pass out with the recipes. Cooking classes usually provide you with recipes and pass outs and stuff. So that's a big difference too. But they get a catalog, they get an order form, we get back in the living room and we still decompress. Hey, what products did you use? Who was in charge of making the chicken alfredo soup? All that. No different than a regular cooking party. Um, but I did want to tell you one more thing about the, the repeat customers that I forgot to mention to you earlier, was that people that have already purchased from us, you know, we think, oh my gosh, the best thing to do is find a whole bunch of new people at my next Pampered Chef party. Do you think they spend the most money? Like brand new customers who've never been to a party? Because a lot of times they aren't familiar with us. They just kind of buy politely. If we can get, how many of you have had a girl who had a party she comes back to the next party and she spends another hundred dollars and she keeps doing it over and over and over. Repeat customers are so valuable because number one, they are less price sensitive. And what I mean by that is maybe the first time they come to our party, they're not used to our pricing. They might think, well, geez, I can go to Walmart. But the second time they're exposed to us, they're not price sensitive. They already know and they expect it. They also provide tons of referrals. If you can keep these people in your loop, lots of referrals, they become repeat. They, re they become repeat customers. So my challenge for you today, and I could ramble on, but you know, I think we're pretty much um, covered most of it. But my challenge for you today is to think differently now about your customers. Do you think a little bit differently about how valuable those are? Yeah, there was an right. old, was a Girl Scout leader for lots of years. Imagine these people let me coach their girls. I mean, it was really, <laughs> um, but um, there, was a song, there was a song about new friends and old, you know, make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other gold. And it really is true. We want to keep bringing people in, but now we're going to really work hard to keep those customers yeah. that we already have and bring them back into our loop and get them back to this purchase. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>